members, uh, thank you so much. We will get going again. Thank you for coming back after the recess. And the next bill up here is House File 2228. Representative Howard, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move this bill for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Howard moves House File 2228 be laid over for possible inclusion into the House Omnibus Tax Bill. Representative Howard, please begin. Thank you, Chair Marquart. I've been uh, banished to the nursery slash home office for the, the night hearing, so, uh, but glad to be here to present this bill. Uh, and it is one that's similar in uh, focus and goal uh, to the previous bill. Uh, in which we see a tax system where uh, corporations, large multinational corpor corporations, use complicated tax practices to limit their tax liability, costing states and our country billions of dollars. Uh, and sometimes these companies are able to utilize these pract practices to eliminate all of their taxes. And I just want to highlight one of those examples. Um, right now we're on the Zoom platform. That's a... a business that most of us didn't have any idea existed a year ago. They had uh, profits last year increased by 4,000%, yet they will pay zero federal taxes. Um, and I don't know the specific, uh, can't comment on the specific methods, but it just highlights that uh, the ability of these large uh, multinational corporations to avoid paying taxes. Meanwhile, wholly domestic Minnesota businesses, our Main Street businesses, they do not have those same tools to game the system to evade their tax liability. And this creates an unfair playing field in the marketplace. Uh, and of course, as all of us have uh, shared in this committee in this session, we know that it's our smallest businesses that have been harmed the most during this pandemic. And so this bill aims to make our tax system more fair, leveling the playing field by utilizing uh, a reporting method known as worldwide reporting. Uh, currently, Minnesota is a water's edge state for tax collection purposes, uh, meaning that we require businesses to report their income and profits from business conducted within the United States. But as was discussed earlier with Corruption of Markworth's bill, we know that profits are being shifted uh, uh, out of this country. And uh, I believe Representative Markworth highlighted an example um, in Bermuda, Cayman Islands is another, where uh, it, they have profits of one. Uh, or profits of 1,000% of their entire island's GDP reported by uh, corporations. And so what this worldwide reporting uh, bill would do is simply uh, require companies to report their worldwide profits from all of their subsidiaries. We would then use the single sales factor apportionment to account for their tax liability here in Minnesota. Uh, worldwide reporting would have a positive effect in terms of leveling the playing field for small businesses. Uh, you know, they don't have the ability to, to shift their profits and earnings to the Cayman Islands. And based on research, it is a change that will be welcomed by our small businesses. A survey uh, conducted of small businesses showed that seven in 10 feel they are hurt when large businesses avoid taxes. 75% of those businesses said large corporations, quote, should not be able to choose to declare some of, or all of their income in a foreign country in order to lower their taxes. Members, during this pandemic, corporations and the ultra-rich have seen their profits soar, while thousands of Minnesotans and our smallest businesses have felt pain like never before. Uh, these disparate outcomes are not a product of chance. They are the product of policy choices that favor the rich and the powerful at the expense of many. And we have an opportunity to do something that is both right, fair, and just uh, in passing this bill and building a state where all Minnesotans have the ability to thrive. And with that, I would open it up to questions. Representative Howard, thank you so much. And let's go to test the fires first, if we can. Um, is Lynn Hoskins on the Zoom? Lynn Hoskins. And, and Mr. Chair? Representative Howard. I know that there was at least one testifier that was uh, potentially going to have difficulty joining us in the evening and was going to submit testimony. Okay, okay. That, it, that could be Lynn Hoskins. Thank you. Um, Davis Sensman. Yep, right here. Davis Sensman, uh, welcome uh, to the committee and 
Please state your name and begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Marquardt and members of the committee. My name is Davis Sensman. I'm the founder of Davis Law Office, and I'm the co-chair of the advisory board of the Main Street Alliance of Minnesota. As a member of Main Street Alliance's advisory board and as a small business attorney with nearly 1,000 Minnesota small business clients, I'm here today to testify on their behalf to urge this committee to pass House File 2228. As you know, and as Representative Howard spoke to, Minnesota's small businesses and their hardworking owners have weathered the worst economic environment in any recent memory in this past year plus. Anything this committee, its counterparts in the Senate, and the governor's office can do to help those small businesses is welcome and desperately needed. And House File 2228 would do just that. It would be a small but important step towards helping our Minnesota small businesses as it would raise revenue for the state from multinational corporations and level the playing field a bit for those who have not found ways to prosper through the pandemic. The small businesses that we represent through Main Street Alliance are the backbone of Minnesota. They provide nearly 50% of Minnesota jobs and they're owned and operated by actual tax paying Minnesota citizens. Those that according to the SBA have a median income of less than $50,000. Those that are paying taxes on all of their earnings and don't have the luxury of shifting portions of it to be claimed as income in a tax haven country. These Minnesota business owners have spent the past year relying heavily on the social services that the great state of Minnesota has historically been able to provide and which are funded by our tax base. And after the year plus they've had, these Minnesota business owners who often make very much less than $50,000 a year are not worried about whether the income they've shifted offshore will be taxed, but they're worried about whether there will be enough money to fund Minsure or the child care assistance program if this current economic downturn continues. Even more, they'd like to see this legislature finally make investments that would make a huge difference for all of their families, their ability to attract and retain employees, and their bottom lines, like making health care accessible and affordable by establishing Minnesota Care as a public option for individuals, or expanding access to child care by raising CCAP reimbursement rates and building a plan to fully fund early childhood education so if the families that work for their businesses don't have to pay more than 7% of their income for it. These are the issues Minnesota small business owners care about, and they broadly support paying for them and helping their fellow Minnesota citizen business owners by closing multinational corporate income tax loopholes via bills like House File 2228. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I think we'll go to the next testifier, and then if we have any questions for the testifiers, we will uh, do it at that time. So uh, Beth Cadoon. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Beth Cadoon, but Beth Cadoon and I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. We are in strong opposition to these two bills as they would greatly increase corporate tax burdens and harm Minnesota's competitiveness. I agree with the testimony provided earlier this afternoon by Ms. Larson and Mr. Nicely. I'll pro provide a few additional comments. The reality is Minnesota competes in a global marketplace and also competes with other states. So it is important for Minnesota to have a competitive business climate with other states and nations. This bill in the earlier Marquardt bill will result in large tax increases on many Minnesota-based headquartered companies and put them at a competitive disadvantage with their foreign competitors, um, not to mention the additional cost and complexities that would be created. As was well stated in the cost letters that you received and in previous testimony, these bills will make Minnesota an extreme tax outlier. As under House File 2228, no other state or country in the world uses a, the mandatory worldwide um, combine reporting method, and no other state utilizes the method in the earlier bill. This is, is trying to tax income earned out of, outside of Minnesota and outside of the United States. House File 2228 would require mandatory worldwide combined reporting. And um, the other bill, although taking a different path, its practical impact of including the CFCs with guilty and the domestic combined filing group is, is to compel Minnesota corporate taxpayers into something that closely also resembles mandatory worldwide combined reporting. This mandatory worldwide combined reporting had been tried in other states and rejected both for the international geopolitical reasons and due to the inequities and embedded complexities, including double taxation of foreign earnings. Most recently, this re approach was considered again and rejected by the Organi Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We would urge Minnesota to reject this as well. 
In addition to raising taxes at this time, it's certainly hard to explain to our private sector employers and taxpayers that are already paying tax rates among the highest in the nation that they now need to pay even more, especially considering the fact that the state has a $1.6 billion surplus, $1.8 billion in budget reserves, $2.87 billion growth in spending that's already occurring under current law, Plus, there's an additional $7.95 billion in federal funds coming into the state from the American Rescue Plan, with $2.6 billion coming directly from the to the state. And add the fact that we're still in the midst of a pandemic and coming off the worst economic downturn in over 70 years. These bills would greatly increase the cost side of Minnesota's business climate that is already a serious concern. Although not is not the only factor, the tax climate and cost issues are an important consideration in business decision making and the flow of capital invest and investment. We urge you to oppose these two bills that will make Minnesota a tax outlier in the area of taxation of foreign income. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for either one of the testifiers? And I don't see any further testifiers. Any questions from members? Very good. Uh, questions uh, from members for the author of the bill? Representative Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Representative did, Howard, I, I think we're all worldwide combined reporting out today. They must have had <laughs> enough guilty and worldwide reporting. Uh, Representative Howard. Very good. Uh, that's just fine with me, Mr. Chair. Um, in way of closing comments, uh, I, I just did want to respond that uh, there are, I think you might have mentioned this earlier today, Representative Marquardt, but there's about two dozen states that are uh, taxing guilty, and there's a number of states looking at doing this as well. And it, whether it, other states are taking this approach or not doesn't, it, it seems to me the concept that we have, when we have corporations shifting profits into the Bahamas and Cayman Islands, how in the world uh, can we justify that when we see what, especially what our small businesses have been through this year? And so um, whether we have a budget surplus or budget deficit should not dictate what is plainly right and wrong. And that's what I see in this bill, an ability to uh, create a fair tax system for Minnesotans. Uh, and so with that, I'd encourage your support and would renew my motion to lay this bill over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Howard. Representative Howard renews his motion to lay over House File 2228 for possible inclusion into the House omnibus tax bill. Thank you very much. Uh, next bill on the agenda is House File 1975. Representative Les Lagarde, would you like to move your bill? So moved, Mr. Chair. And Representative Les Lagarde moves to lay over House File 1975 for possible inclusion into the tax ominous bill. Would you like to uh, move your A1 amendment? So moved, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Les Lagarde moves the A1 amendment. Any comments on this? Is that anything we need to know before we vote and put that onto the bill right now? Mr. Chair, the A1 amendment uh, clarifies one definition and makes a technical change to the section pertaining to how the credit will be allowed. It'll be discussed in the bill. Very good. And members, any questions on that before we vote? If not, uh, please unmute yourself temporarily as we vote on uh, the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Uh, the motion does prevail. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Les Lagarde to House File 1975 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. Uh, before I read my brief um, remarks, this is, this is really about opportunity for the state of Minnesota, an industry that is about to explode, and they're looking for a place to go. And Minnesota could build a foundation that is not only incredibly job creation in, in, in helping our businesses, but it can be sustainable. And this is, that, that is what this is, maintaining the jobs we currently have and also creating new ones for the future in a time when we desperately need it in the state of Minnesota. So that's my little opening remarks. 
Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I am, I am happy to bring House File 1975, which would create a film and TV credit for the state of Minnesota. This credit will be a powerful economic development tool for the state of Minnesota. And it has an impressive track record in other states and around the world. Multiple studies demonstrate that the benefit to local communities is amazing. In St. Louis County, the region where I'm from, we have seen the benefits from a tax program that was passed by the local county board. It should be noted that more than 30 other states have tax credits and or rebate programs for production made in their states. And while Minnesota has a rebate, it hasn't been consistently funded. An incentive program like a film credit is the only way to build this thriving industry and allow it to be sustainable. So many other states and countries have implemented film credits due to the, the success it brings. It is now a necessary condition for attracting large or any projects to our state. In conversations with HBO and other production and artist agencies in Los Angeles, and Minnesota partners in this state, they all say they take a look first at what the state and what incentive it has to offer. This is a truly a but for proposal. Without a tax credit, they will not come. Minnesota is a perfect place to build this industry. We have a workforce infrastructure in the relevant trades, which you're gonna hear about later from our brothers and sisters in the industry and the trades that support it. We have the talent, we have the geographic diversity, we have the seasons, we have the interested parties, and we have the work ethic in this state. The missing ingredients is this incentive, and we have to move forward. The moment and the time is right. This is a bipartisan effort, and I want to thank both Democrats and Republicans who have reached out to me. Representative Abaji, uh, Representative Howard, Joaquin, uh, Representative Davids, McDonald's, all indicated their support for this. They see the moment, and they want to seize it. So I would like to turn it over to Melody uh, from the Minnesota Film and TV Commission to explain the bill and talk more about the, in, uh, the industry as it relates to Minnesota, with your permission, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Representative Leslie And I see we've got five testifiers, so I would ask each testifier to try to keep your testimony about three minutes. And um, so, uh, Melody uh, Bahan is first. If you would please uh, introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Melody Bahan, and I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Film and TV. Thank you for allowing me to testify in support of House File 1905. Tax programs are investments states make to achieve specific goals, and this one is no different. Our goals are to bring new spending to Minnesota that will not otherwise come here, to create new high-paying jobs, to rebuild a workforce lost to other states since incentive programs began in the late 1990s, and to promote Minnesota as a great place to live, work, and visit. More than 30 states have production incentive programs as part of their economic development and job growth strategies. And the most successful of these programs are tax credit programs. This bill has been crafted to benefit Minnesota and the industry in our state. While some other states have more generous incentives than those in this bill, this program will allow Minnesota to compete for the billions of dollars that are spent on production each year in this country. And importantly, allow us to pursue a television or streaming series, a project that will spend multiple years in the state around which we can rebuild our industry and grow our workforce. The bill before you will create, <clears throat> excuse me, a transferable tax credit of up to 25% on qualified in-state expenditures for TV and film production in Minnesota. The state puts out zero dollars on the credits until a production company spends the money here in the state first, paying all the applicable taxes on their spending. This bill also includes a number of guardrails. 
each project is required to submit an audit upon completion and prior to any credits being issued by the state. The bill also requires an economic impact report to the legislature after several years. The program is capped at $25 million per fiscal year and includes a sunset of 10 years. Thank you for allowing me to testify and I welcome your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Bayen, for that. Uh, we'll move to the next, and we have Emily Larson. Mayor Larson, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and please begin. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Chair Marquardt, for allowing me to speak today. My name is Emily Larson. I'm mayor of the city of Duluth, and I am here to speak in support of House File 1975. I'm grateful to spend just a few moments with you speaking to Representative Liz Lagarde's bill to create a state tax credit program for film and television. Here in Duluth and St. Louis County, we do have a tax incentive that's been put in place by the county board. We are grateful for that. It has definitely been utilized and it is a very high visibility sign that our region is ready for film. Uh, we have 30 productions that are ready to go, that we have 30 projects that have an interest in coming here with, with a budget of $40 million total. A very conservative estimate of that 40 million is about uh, 14 to 15 million of that would be spent locally. Uh, you've heard already that there are programs in other states with tax incentives. There's a tremendous amount of research and study that has been done in many of those states. In the state of Utah, for every $1 that was invested through incentive and utilized through incentive, there was a GDP increase to the state of $14. The revenue numbers work. Uh, the work ethic is there. You will hear about that uh, shortly. Luring film and TV production is valuable to states and regions because production creates good jobs and injects money into the economy. We are already, as a city, investing our time and attention into workforce development strategies to build both above the line and below the line jobs that can sustain this economy. Production also brings visibility and a sense of prestige. The why that's important is because with that comes an interest to see where this is where to see where the action is to see where the work is to get tourists and to expand sales tax not just for our city and our county and our region but for the entire state like you've heard 30 states along with countries like canada and ireland have very successful incentives that attract productions and i want to be really clear this is not just about if you build it they will come we have way more interest uh, then we can support through the tax incentive. We have projects that are waiting. And if we had an expansion and a partnership with the state, if, if they are coming <laughs> and they're waiting, they are waiting on their production. Part of it is that other states have slowed down with COVID. Part of it is that there are projects that have had to slow down, they're ready to go. This region is ready. The city of Duluth, St. Louis County uh, is ready to be the home and the next great place of visual storytelling in the industry. I ask for your support of this bill and I am ready to answer any questions that you may have. Thank, Thank you, Chair. You. Thank you very much, Mayor Larson. Nice to have you with us tonight. Uh, next, we have Brian Simpson. Please introduce yourself. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, my name is Brian Simpson. I'm a member of IATSC Local 490. Um, as you heard, uh, this uh, industry is rapidly growing. Um, there are 2.1 million jobs and $139 billion in wages each year in the United States. Um, but what I want to talk about briefly is what this would be like in Minnesota. Um, this bill is not about sustaining existing careers that we already have. This is about creating new careers. And if this bill were to pass, as it is written now, the existing labor pool in Minnesota would not be enough to satisfy the demand created. This would require training new employees, Minnesota residents, and these new careers will not require a college degree. And we're oftentimes, it's oftentimes said that uh, film and TV is nothing but temp jobs. So these are not temporary jobs. They are um, akin to the construction industry in that we are a project-based industry. Um, this is also not a grant for the arts. This is more like modern day manufacturing, and this is impossible to automate. Film and TV production, even the animated kind, can only be done by real people working real middle class jobs. Um, the jobs that will be created by this bill 
These will be union jobs. They will come with health benefits, retirement benefits. They will come with safety training, harassment prevention training, even equipment certification. And as I mentioned, this bill would require a significant increase in the Minnesota labor pool. Um, in anticipation of that, we were already laying the groundwork for how that will happen in Minnesota. We'll be working with the Minnesota Film Office, uh, MCTC, and DEED to create a certified jobs training program. Some of those classes will be taught by local 490 members so that we can build this industry back in Minnesota the right way. Um, but we can't do this without this bill. Due to competition from other states and Canada, Minnesota has been exporting these jobs for at least 20 years now, but we can bring them back and we need this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next up, we have Ed Reynoso. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Please begin. Member Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Edward Reynoso. I'm the political director for Teamsters Joint Council 32. We represent an excess of 62,000 active and retired members in the state of Minnesota. I'm here to testify uh, in support of House File 1975. Now, Teamsters represent virtually all of the drivers on a set. Uh, anything on wheels is normally operated by a Teamster. We're normally the first ones on a set and the last ones off a set. And the work that our members perform provide great wages, as what was stated before by, by my, my brother, Brian, um, and uh, phenomenal benefits and a pension that allows them to live comfortably into retirement. But the problem is that we have here in Minnesota is that there's very little work for our members here in Minnesota. So they normally are chasing work in other states, such as Pennsylvania, Virginia, Ohio, and Georgia. Uh, but we'd like to change that. Uh, we believe we can grow this industry here so that it provides new jobs for many Minnesotans. Uh, this industry supports an excess of 2.1 million jobs across the country. Uh, we believe that we can do many of those jobs here. And so we urge your support of uh, House File 1975. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. The last person I have is Van Hayden. Very good. Welcome to the committee and please state your testimony. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, some of you may be familiar with my last name, one of your colleagues, uh, Jeffrey Hayden. He's my second cousin. Uh, <laughs> he didn't survive the last round, but uh, he started on the House side and, and, and made it. And you bet. Elected. He was a former House member. Very good. Yes. Thanks yeah. for uh, making that relationship there. So thank you. Absolutely. Uh, my, my pleasure. Well, I'll, I'm I'm very happy to testify. I'm very versed. Would, in, would you officially state your name then for the committee? Yes, I, I don't know. I, if I am I am officially Van Hayden. Very good. <laughs> uh, a, 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 na a native of the Northland. Uh, it's very. It was wonderful to meet my uh, my mayor. I have not met her yet, Mayor Larson. Meeting her virtually here. I think she's met my sister, Vanny Hayden, uh, and. Uh, we grew up in Duluth. We moved there when we were, I was five years old, she was seven years old. Our parents divorced. We ended up with our grandparents, you know, growing up in Duluth. Went through, always went through public schools, never spent a day in private school. Uh, went to Lincoln Junior High and uh, Lincoln Elementary and, and uh, Denville and Central. So we covered the entire kind of range of, of the school system up there. And then I went to, you know, a little background, I went to, I came down to the U. Uh, uh, it was, I had decent enough grades to, to get into CLA and uh, studied journalism and political science. That track took me into journalism and I had planned to be a Washington correspondent. That, that was my motivation, my goal. And I had several distinguished uh, internships around the country at new, various newspapers. And I stumbled into this film business uh, while working a summer internship in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Daily News. And I'd seen the movie, She's Gotta Have It, that Spike Lee directed. Uh, and it was like a, an epiphany. I said, wow, people are hired to make movies. I'd never really put that one and two together before. And that opened a whole possibility for me that never existed. Uh, I, I finished when I finished school. I spent uh, a year working at U.S. Video over on Lake Street to, to be able to build my uh, repertoire for knowledge of film. And uh, 
And I sent a letter to Spike Lee one day saying, hey, I'd love to come out. I live in Minnesota. I'm born and raised here. And uh, I'd love to come out and work on one of your next productions. Later that, the following week, I got a call uh, saying, well, all of the our entry level jobs are filled, but you know, if you're willing to come out here, put yourself up, for, uh, we, we can't pay you. Uh, you'll, we'll feed you because uh, they'll have a caterer and they provide food and stuff. And, and I said, I'd love to do it. And I did that, I went out there and that launched my entire career. Uh, that was in 1989. And ever since, and I, my dream is to bring film and television back to Minnesota. Uh, I live in Minneapolis. I live in the Minnehaha Park area, uh, right on Snelling, right off of the 46th Street train stop, the light rail stop. And, uh, you know, but I get on that train and I take it down to the airport. When I get offered jobs in Los Angeles, I just finished up the show Keenan for NBC. It's a, the new Warren Michaels spinoff from SNL, Kenan Thompson show. Uh, that show ended a week and a half ago. I got a call. Hey, are you available to come to Atlanta to, to do the reboot of the Wonder Years pilot? I said, sure. I came home for two days. I got back on the plane and I was in Atlanta three hours later. And I guess this is the kind of nomadic lifestyle of the film crews that are from Minnesota we have to keep going all these other places because we need this bill. We need a, you know, we need a transferable tax credit because there's no, and I've done some producing myself. I brought two films to Minnesota. One we shot in Stillwater about five or six years ago. M and Mr. Those, Hayden, would you finish in about 30 seconds, please? Yes, I will. Yes, okay. I will. Thank you. As you know, my cousin, you know, we, we are long winded. <laughs> Those senators, I understand. No <laughs> filibuster here, though. Um, so, but the point is, we need this, and I am the typical uh, film worker. I'm in a union. I have a, I have retirement benefits, and and this would, and as Brian said so eloquently, you do not need a college education to make a real living wage. And I, I can't put myself behind this any stronger than I than I just did. Thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate that. So members, any questions at this time for any of the testifiers? I don't see any. Uh, members, any questions for the author of the bill or any comments on the bill? Uh, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so to uh, Representative Listegard, I have uh, co-authored this bill in the past and do support it. I personally have experienced uh, what great economic activity it brings to a, a communities here in Minnesota, particularly a simple plan, which was filmed here in Delano, right outside my photo studio, in which I had a small Academy Award winning six second part in that movie. Uh, but more importantly, I, I saw what it did to our local town and the economy and the, the monies and the activities in the dead of winter in Minnesota. And just uh, I, I know it is, it's an important bill, and it's but for until we have this uh, incentive, which I think is very good incentives for our, our state tax incentive, allowing companies and corporations to keep more of their money so they can keep invest it back into their businesses and make it profitable. And uh, I think it's just a great idea and I do support it. Uh, but a question for you, Representative Listergard, uh, because we do have a lot of great talent here. And I have a good friend, Milo Durbin. He's worked on many, many films, Fargo, um, and a list goes on. Many folks that are probably watching this know my friend Milo Durbin, he's in the film business. Anyway, uh, we have great talent here. What assurances in your bill does it allow to make sure then when a production comes into Minnesota, and or even when local companies uh, shoot commercials such as Target and other companies, Polaris, what assurances do we have in your bill that they'll use our good local Minnesota talents and from actors to extras to post productions uh, and uh, grips and, and you name it? Representative Lesnagard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that was a wonderful question, Representative McDonald. I'm gonna kick that right over to Melody as this is her world and she can best answer that question. All right, very good. Uh, Ms. Bain. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, that is a great question. Um, the uh, the incentive is uh, geared to promote local hiring and local spending. Therefore, um, the wages that are covered, if you, if you are flying in your crew and paying them for a Minnesota job, you're not gonna get incentivized for those wages. You are only gonna get incentive for the wages that are paid to Minnesota residents. That's how the programs work. Uh, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so in does that is that language in the bill? Because the intent is great. Yes, we, we definitely want to use uh, local talent. And sometimes there's, that's just not feasible. So they do fly in and, and have other productions, uh, other outside talent. And that's uh, given. But what assurances do we have that um, we will use local talent? And I'll give you an example. Um, Explore Minnesota, a number of years ago, did a commercial on Minnesota. But most everyone was hired in Wisconsin. The production, the films, talent, actors, Wisconsin, on Explore Minnesota. So I think we need, do need to make sure that there is in language in the law that when all possible, they use Minnesota talent to get that credit back. So the question is, is that Representative Lessigard, is there language in the bill that says that? I think that's going to miss Ben. Mr. Chair, I would defer to um, Melody to answer that. Okay, Ms. Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, uh, if you look the in the definitions, um, eligible production costs refers back to uh, uh, statute 116U.26, which is uh, the statute that created the, re the current rebate program, and eligible costs are defined as Minnesota wages in that. Um, we would also, that is also something that would be covered in, in the uh, administrative guidelines. But yes, it is in the, in the original statute that created the program. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much then. Just to, again, I'll make it brief, Mr. Chair and Representative Listegard. I have seen firsthand, I've actually been in about five or six film productions, television commercials and big films. So I do see what they bring to town and to our state uh, the, the activity, the economic activity, the excitement, uh, it is good for our state and it's a good, uh, it's a good business plan. But for, if they don't come, they're going somewhere else, we wouldn't get the money anyway. So it's a good program. I support it. And I thank you for bringing it to uh, this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Listergaard. Thank you. Representative Joaquin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to speak up because we had a film uh, made in Hopkins too, quite a few years ago. Thin Ice with Greg Kinnear, and they had um, 40 people housed right in Hopkins in one of our warehouses for the production company. It was a smaller production, but I talked to business owners on Main Street and a lot of our lunch spots and how much money they made just in the local economy, just for, for lunches and all the film crews that were here. It wasn't totally filmed in Hopkins, but the production studio was here, and they did have some stuff in Hopkins and all over the state. So. I, I want to put a pitch in for seeing it happen in real time. And then I think um, I'm glad that Ms. Bann mentioned the original statute in reference, but also on line 2.3, um, it does say to the extent practicable that employees Minnesota residents. So there's a little um, belt and suspenders there as well, too. So thank you. Thank, thank you for bringing this forward, Representative Lagarde. Thank you. Representative Gomez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I had I just had a question, and maybe this is for Rep. Liz Lagarde, or maybe for research, but or I, I I don't know somebody else. But I'm just wondering about the transferability stuff and um, the sale of the tax credit. And if honestly, this is like a little confusing for me. I think because I know I've had research explain this to me at least once. But I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about it and why that's necessary. Uh, somebody, I don't know, Miss. Bayan, you want to answer that, or we can go to staff too. But Ms. Bayan, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Gomez. Uh, I will try and answer that. Uh, transferability is important. Um, like many other types of tax credits, there is a market for uh, the buying and selling of these credits. So. 
what happens is the credit is um, for a future Minnesota state tax liability that the credit holder has. So they can use that to offset their, their tax liability. If it's a company, if a company is awarded the tax credit that does not have a tax liability in Minnesota, then they are able to sell that tax credit to a Minnesota company that can take advantage of it and use the credit. Um, there are other tax credits like historic tax credits and uh, low income housing tax credits that work in the same way uh, with the transferability. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Mr. Williams or whoever would, would anyone care to also, or Mr. Clayman, is, is that the way you understand that? to be? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, um, yeah, I wouldn't have much more to add to that. The, the transferability allows, uh, you know, the person who qualifies for their credit to actually transfer that or to sell that to another taxpayer. And there could be a number of reasons why a taxpayer might want to do that, you know, for the historic structure credit. Um, you know, there could be a nonprofit who's not taxable under Minnesota law, and they would want to sell that tax credit to somebody who could utilize it. And I think Ms. Bayhan was speaking about a similar issue where you might have a, a business that's not taxable in Minnesota and they would wanna sell that credit to a, a business that was. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate that. So, so, even, so a business that didn't have any Minnesota tax liability could then sell the credit and like get cash for it. Is that, uh, that's how this works? Mr. Clayman? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Gomez, um, there's, there's no real requirement that uh, the person who, the taxpayer who is, or the, uh, the, the person who receives the credit um, has to not be able to take it in order to sell it. It just allows that to be transferred. Um, and the language of the bill would seem like it only allows it once so they could transfer it to one additional taxpayer, um, you know, if they wanted to, uh, if it's in their interest to do so. Representative Gomez. I guess just a comment on that uh, um, is that, uh, you know, I, I think with, my understanding was that with like, you know, low income housing tax credits, for example, the reason that they're transferable like that is um, because uh, you know, it's really hard to put together financing for a housing project, an affordable housing project particularly, that, that qualifies for low-income housing tax credit. And and I guess this is just me, but like to me, that's, uh, you know, when we're giving, I mean, this seems like the transferability makes it a much more um, kind of, I don't know if it makes it much more expensive. I would imagine that it, that it does, but it makes it a much more kind of uh, valuable commodity, I think. And 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 I, I don't know if there are other cases where we do this, but I guess for me, I'm sort of like the, um, you know, building affordable housing is like a compelling case for allowing that kind of flexibility that I think to me creates a little bit of like not as many guardrails around the, pro the program. So I, I guess that's just a comment, but um, I appreciate it. Thanks for the, um, just uh, allowing me the latitude because I had trouble with the transferability stuff. Thanks. You bet, thank you. Uh, Representative Hurtas. Well, good evening again, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative McDonald uh, forgot to mention one of the great classic uh, movies uh, filmed right here in Minnesota in my home city of Greenfield and Independence and his town of Delano, Grumpy Old Men, oh, yeah. uh, was filmed uh, in Lake Rebecca Park, all of the uh, lake and fish house scenes. Uh, Representative Liz Lagarde, um, this production credit, as I understand, uh, did expire some time ago. And could you talk about a little bit about reenactment of this, if it should happen, uh, how the um, production industry waned in its absence and and what this provides an opportunity, how much economic activity you think would come back? Do you have any information about that? Representative Lesslingart. 
Mr. Chair um, and Representative Hurtop, that's a great question. I'm going to address some of that in my closing comments, but I will go back to Ms. Bain um, from an industry perspective, since she lives this every day, that she probably could relay that question to you. And I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Clayman, have we ever had a credit for film credit, or has it always been the snow bait uh, grant rebate program? I don't know if we've ever had a credit. Uh, Mr. Chair, and I'm not aware of any uh, tax credit that the state has ever had for films. There may be other testifiers that remember something in the past, but I don't remember anything in recent memory. There's been the uh, uh, fairly consistent appropriations to Minnesota Film and TV Board uh, over the past number of years, but that's that's the only thing that that uh, I can think of off the top of my head right now. Very good. So it looks like, thank you, Representative Hurtaz, Representative Lessigard will address that in his Closing yeah. statements, is that okay on that part? Do you have other questions? Yeah, just a, a little bit of a follow-up. So does anybody remember uh, what that program was about and how much money we spent on that to uh, get uh, film production in terms of grants? Uh, was, was, is somebody familiar with a dollar amount on that? Yeah, it's anyone from staff. Otherwise, I can go to one of the testifiers. Any, uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Clayman, do you know? Uh, yeah, I believe in... in the last uh, appropriation I saw to the film and TV board was a uh, million dollars in the last biennium. Um, again, there may be other testifiers that have a better handle on that, but. Okay. Uh, and Ms. Bain, have you got an idea of what that was with snow bait? Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, representatives. Yes, um, the, the production rebate program also formerly known as Snowbait, has continued. It was established uh, in the late 1990s um, and has been funded fairly inconsistently over the years uh, in it, 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 anywhere from uh, $5 million per fiscal year down to zero. Um, and part of our desire to have a tax credit is to have some consistency. Um, it's very difficult for uh, producers for companies to plan productions, which take a lot of work, a lot, of, a lot of time to prepare for, um, particularly for a, a series, an episodic program, um, if they don't know what the program is going, to, what program is going to exist. So the investment that was made um, in the rebate program has been fairly small, but um, I don't have the numbers in front of me and I apologize. The return has been great and we do have those numbers available and I'd be happy to get those to you representative uh, tomorrow. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Thank representative you. Hurtas. Thank, thank you. You know, and, and that was my memory even before I was in the legislature that uh, we were uh, appropriating or having some type of a grant or aid or credit or something to basically um, lure or uh, stimulate this type of activity uh, and create a competitiveness with other markets in the state. So, uh, you know, it, hearing numbers like 5 million, 1 million, 2 million, it sounds like since the 90s for the last 20 years, uh, we've had some of this and then of course some of it has waned and perhaps uh, less of it going. Uh, so is, is that fairly accurate that, um, that there's been kind of a, a dry well for a while here and that we haven't had this type of uh, production in Minnesota, is that correct? Uh, Ms. Bayhan? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, that is correct. We have not had uh, I, what I would call a major production in uh, certainly not in the four years that that I have been executive director of the organization, during which the fis per fiscal year appropriation for the rebate program has been half a million dollars. Generally, those funds are allocated within a month or two. Um, because the amount of money we're talking about for projects, you know, a, a television series uh, will spend anywhere from four to eight million dollars per episode. Um, and that's with a, you know, a season of 10 episodes. So uh, it's just our, our program has not kept pace with um, programs in other states. Okay. So, Representative Hurtas. 
Thank you. Uh, closing comment, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, this has been good information, and it's uh, pretty clear that the argument is being made that in order to have competitiveness with other states, we need this uh, production credit and basically to stimulate uh, this type of activity in our state. And so, Mr. Chair and, um, and Representative Lislegard, I think you've just made the case, what we've been saying for quite a long time, that lower taxes and competitiveness uh, makes a very good reason to stimulate all Minnesota business, including those who produce other things beside movies. So I hope you would keep that in mind as you think this is a great idea that those who are uh, positioned here in a permanent way uh, can remain competitive and grow their uh, businesses, their companies, and their jobs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is a question maybe to, uh, uh, to fiscal staff, uh, Mr. Thiemann, potentially. Uh, you know, we just heard a bill, the last bill we heard was uh, talking about global uh, income for businesses. And, you know, we're trying to attract particular types of build businesses focused in on uh, film, the film industry. And how would this interact? Let's say both of those bills were both passed. Um, would the film industry see a greater burden if they work internationally or just uh, doing business throughout the United States as far as reporting that income while it's being created here in Minnesota? Would that kind of leave them open to those types of things or, or how, how would that process work if these two bills were put together? Mr. Clayman. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Swazinski, uh, you know, to some extent that's, that's going to depend on, you know, whether the, a number of factors, you know, the first one being is, is the film production company or a, a studio, are they, be, are they a corporation and would they be subject to the corporate franchise tax? Um, versus uh, the individual income tax if they're a pass-through entity. And then the other question would be, um, if so, does that uh, business entity, does that production company, do they have nexus with the state of Minnesota such that um, the state could tax them? Um, and they, you know, they may or may not if there are, for instance, if there are business entities that would like to transfer the credit because they're not taxable in Minnesota, that could be a, a nexus issue. Um, but if they did have Nexus and they were a corporation, um, then that that business is, uh, you know, if the worldwide com combined reporting bill uh, was enacted, then that that business would um, would or or the the members of the combined group that were taxable in Minnesota uh, would apportion the worldwide income of the entire group, and so they they could in many cases end up. Um, uh, be having the, the taxable income go up and and therefore the rate uh, therefore the amount of tax that they would pay would also go up at the same time but there 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 are a lot of you know different factors that would go into exactly what would happen in every situation but I, that's probably the best i can do on the fly here uh mr chair yeah, I, I think you did very well mr clayman <laughs> with a very thank you, complicated thank question thank representative swazinski thank you mr chair thank you uh mr clayman you did a great job you know i mean I'm going to just kind of read into that answer a little bit um, just with my next reply. But so if I were to read you correctly, if that uh, production company has Nexus in Minnesota and they are currently doing work outside of the state or internationally um, producing movies, they would actually have less incentive uh, to perform more work here in the state because of that if we were to bring those two together. So we'd actually put more incentive on out of state production companies uh, because of if we combine those two, then uh, simply production companies that would be uh, located in the state. Is that, is that question represents Wazinski or, or comment? I think that was more of a comment, Mr. Okay. Chair. Okay. Thank you for very, your time. Very good. very good, thank you. I just wanted to be clear. Um, Representative McDonald. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, since my name was mentioned, and you know the history, uh, of course, in this uh, uh, tradition of this committee. No, I did have a question uh, regarding that, uh, maybe for Mr. Clavin, but uh, one of the reasons that I didn't mention Grumpy Old Men, Representative Hurtos, is because I just had started my photo studio here in Delano, and I tried to sneak on the ice fishing, uh, the Lake Rebecca, to take pictures, and some Grumpy Old Men kicked me off. So... Uh, <laughs> That's why I didn't mention that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, see, similar to any 
a professional sports player that uh, plays here in our state, uh, if any particular uh, actor uh, in a production, do they would they have to? Is that what they'd have? Would they have to pay then the part of their income to state income tax? Is that what Representative Swazinski was talking about, Mr. Clayman? Like a baseball player, a football player, they play a certain amount of games or days in Minnesota. How does that work? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, yep, Mr. Chair and members, uh, you know, I'd have to look up the exact state statute that we have on this, but we do have uh, some specific statutes in the state dealing with how uh, uh, I believe sports athletes, maybe entertainers also are taxed. I'd have to take a look at that. But in general, putting aside any special laws we have on that, um, they would just be taxed as, you know, for instance, part year residence. And um, so they would just go through that process of, a, of you know, portioning their income based on their residency percentage. Very good. Representative McDonald. So just to follow up. So, for example, if there is a, a series filmed here, a six months to a nine month series, um, that any, any particular, anyone on the set really would have to pay us a portion of their income tax to the state of Minnesota. Is that correct? It's rep, uh, Mr. Clayman. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, oh, Representative yeah. McDonald, uh, if they have Minnesota source income, um, then they would be taxed on that income in Minnesota if they meet the filing threshold. Representative McDonald. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, a, another uh, non-incentive uh, for them to film here because you could go to a non-state that doesn't have any uh, state income tax. Uh, so it's just food for thought on that um, as far as the income tax. But that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Very good. Representative Les Lagarde, final comments. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Um, if, if you'd indulge me, I just would like to wrap this up in, into a story, um, a real life experience. And we heard about uh, Mighty Ducks and we heard about Grumpy Old Men, great stories. But the state of Minnesota has lots of stories, trials and tribulations. And uh, you know, I was 27 years old, married with two children, um, worked at LTV until it closed in 2001, the very facility that my grandfather built. And uh, at that, I was at a crossroads in my life. And I went back to school and, and uh, at the local community college. And I had to take an elective, scared, fearful to go back to school. And I took a theater class, not to be an actor, um, but just as an extra. And the, the, the professor asked me to go, there was a screening and for a rude and angry minor. And I was very skeptical to do it. But as a typical ranger, extra credit, better grade, I'll go along and I'll do it. And the movie was a life changing for this country. It was the first um, class action sexual harassment suit, Lois Jensen versus the Evelyn Mines a very sad time of history in this state, in this country. But it was a story that needed to be told. And when I auditioned for that, that part, I, I got a call and I, and, uh, and I took the part and I went and did it. And I built relationships and I watched what, what that industry brought to a community in, in a region that lost so much. And, you know, in the next thing you know, um, it was over. And they went to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And they went to Santa Fe, New Mexico because that's where the incentive was. The story that changed the lives of so many people in this country that started in a certain location in Minnesota had to go to Santa Fe, New Mexico because of a film credit. It is a but for. So all the different stories that we have in this state, let's keep in mind, this last year has ripped this country, this world apart for mo so many different reasons. But right here in the state of Minnesota, we've had a situation, a travesty, that the whole world is watching. And at some point, they're going to tell that story. And we want that story to be told here. When we rebuild this city, when we rebuild um, the relationships between people, this story needs to be told in the state of Minnesota. And I guarantee you what, if we don't create an incentive and create jobs in an industry, they may come here and they may take a few shots. They may do a few scenes like they did for North Country, but they will leave. 
and they will take that, that moment, that moment in history that will forever be remembered, they will take it somewhere else. So this is about creating jobs, it's about creating an industry, maintaining what we have, and bringing something for the future for the state of Minnesota. And I ask you seriously to support this, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Representative Les Lagarde and testifiers. Representative Les Lagarde renews his motion uh, to lay over House File 1975 as amended for possible inclusion into the tax omnibus bill. Thank you all. Uh, last bill we have is House File 1733, uh, and we have Representative Hansen. I think I saw Representative Hansen. There he is. Very good. I'm here. So, very good. So members, we're going to be voting on this. So I will move House File 1733 to be re-referred uh, to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, Finance, and Policy. Uh, Representative Hansen, welcome to the committee. And I know you have a, an amendment. Uh, let's, if that's okay, can we move that amendment now? So I would yes, like, I'd to, like to get the bill in the shape. Very good. I'd like to move the A4 amendment. Uh, any thoughts, Representative Hansen? Is this just to get it into the shape you'd like to see it? That is correct, Mr. Chair. Very good. Any other comments from members? If not, I'm gonna ask you to temporarily unmute yourself to call for the vote on the A4 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion does prevail. The A4 amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen, uh, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm I'm a little disappointed because I saw all the people leave after the all the la after the last uh, presentation, and I I thought they were hanging around for my bill. But uh, uh, I'm pleased to be here in the tax committee, and the the reason for this bill, uh, 1733 which had been he heard in my committee uh, in another version and was also in uh, Chair Lilly's committee, was trying to solve a problem uh, that we have had with clean water funds. For the last six years, three different biennia, uh, there has been an appropriation of over $20 million that has gone to soil and water conservation districts. And that, uh, large amount of money was paid was occurred in 2015 2017 and 2019 and this year the request was for 28 million dollars uh, that is in front of uh, uh, the legislature what has happened over time the clean water money is supposed to be special it is supposed to be in addition and so that short-term response back in 2015 has now lasted six years. In 2015 and in 2017, there was language that when there was a surplus, it would repay the clean water fund. In 2019, that did not happen. The other thing that has happened is that there have been some counties that have either reduced or stopped paying, stopped funding their soil and water conservation districts because they are now relying on clean water funds. Members, the Clean Water Fund is in the Constitutional Amendment that will expire in 12 years. Relying on that fund to fund soil and water conservation districts is not appropriate and likely unconstitutional when it is not tied to water quality. What the original bill did was it provided for a local option so that there was some local commitment made tied to land so that when you purchase property in Minnesota, your county could provide that option of uh, a fee that would help pay for those soil and water conservation activities in that county. That fee, a similar fee, has been in effect in the metro area for decades. Uh, I just closed uh, on refinancing my mortgage and I paid a $5 fee as part of that closing, a conservation fee. The amendment you just adopted is in response to the input that was received in the last two committees. There was concern raised by the counties about uh, lack of uniformity. If one county provided it, maybe the other didn't. There was concern about how it would be applied, whether it would be equitable. So the amendment that you just adopted makes it mandatory. A $25 fee 
when you buy property and if you refinance your mortgage. That fee would be dedicated to soil and water conservation activities in that county. There are two counties that uh, do not have soil and water conservation districts. The county has taken over those responsibilities in Hennepin and Ramsey County. So they would collect that fee. What this does it, is it ensures that there is a local match by the counties when we're applying for grants. It ensures that soil and water conservation district activities are tied to land. So when you buy property, you own that land and you're paying a fee that helps provide and protect the soil and water in your county. So I would ask for your support. I know there are a number of written testifiers, but I think they were responding to the prior bill uh, and the, with the amendment, there are revisions. Thank you very much, Representative Hansen. And I would draw your attention in, um, uh, on the website, there are a number of letters, uh, to House File 1733. We do have testifiers. And first up is Amanda Kohler. And again, we're asking for uh, three minutes. And so, uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I, I hope I'll be quicker than that. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come back again today. Um, my name is Amanda Kohler. I'm a policy organizer at the Land Stewardship Project, leading our farmer-driven soil health campaign. We believe our state must publicly invest in programs that provide public benefits. When we care for the soil and invest in our farmers, we are cultivating resilient land, vibrant rural communities, clean water, productive crops, strong local economies, and a sustainable climate. We all benefit from the crucial work of our soil and water conservation districts. They're doing on the ground to support farmers, advance adoption of soil healthy practices, and build a resilient and sustainable farming system. Regardless of zip code, SWCDs deserve to have sufficient budgets, staffing, and resources. Currently, SWCDs across the state have wildly unequal budgets. While some districts have as little as $10,000 per year, others have over a million. These inequalities are strikingly apparent on the landscape. And as I said, regardless of zip code, farmers deserve to have sufficient and equal support, technical assistance and resources through their local SWCD. Right now, there's an incredibly uneven, uneven playing field for our farmers. Uh, this reminds me of our public education system in Minnesota. Because of the over-reliance on property tax levies, so many of our students are being left behind. Similarly, because of the over-reliance on inconsistent county appropriations, so many of our farmers and SWCDs are being left behind. While the state of Minnesota works toward finding a long-term equitable and reliable funding solution um, for our soil and water conservation districts, LSP believes this bill is an important step in the right direction. Together, we can pitch in to ensure that our SWCDs, farmers, and whole communities are as effective as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, Paul Egger. Uh, there you are. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself, begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Paul Egger, and I'm Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Minnesota Realtors Association. We have a membership of over 21,000 real estate professionals working with buyers and sellers of all types of property in every corner of the state. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding our opposition to House File 1733, which would impose new $25 surcharges on both the mortgage registry and deed taxes. Minnesota Realtors does not believe the real estate transaction should be responsible for funding programs and activities that benefit all Minnesotans. We also oppose proposals that would increase the cost of housing, which, H, uh, which House File 1733 does by adding these new surcharges to the existing and regressive mortgage registry and deed taxes. For a little context regarding the fees proposed in House File 1733, Consider that in fiscal year 2019, buyers and sellers paid over $256 million in mortgage registry and deed taxes. For each of those taxes, 97% goes to the general fund and 3% is retained by the counties. And when the market slows like it did during the Great Recession, 
mortgage registry and deed tax revenues drop. For example, from 2007 to 2008, mortgage registry and deed tax collections dropped by 24%, and then in 2009, they dropped another 19%. It is also important to understand that the number of transactions is not uniform across the state. For example, in 2020, our data shows there were 21,410 closed sales in Hennepin County, while in Kitson County, there were 17. And then there are the recording fees. And just a typical seller who's also buying their next home pays the, would pay the deed tax, pay the $46 recording fee for paying off their mortgage on the house they're selling, pay the mortgage registry tax on the house they're buying, pay the $46 recording fee for the mortgage registry, and then pay the $46 recording fee to record the deed. And then in certain counties, as Representative Hansen pointed out, there's an additional $5 conservation fee that's added. The new surcharges in House File 1733 would add to this list. I'd just also like to briefly address the comments made earlier that this revenue source is appropriate because it's tied to the land. Mr. Chair, those who pay the mortgage registry and deed taxes and other fees associated with those taxes and who would also pay these proposed fees already pay another tax tied to their land. It's called the property tax. We would just ask the legislature to refrain from increasing and adding fees on the purchase of the home. We respectfully urge you to reject the fees proposed in House File 1733. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Uh, Amber Boogie is next. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Good evening, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'm Amber Bougie and I serve as the Chief Deputy Recorder for Hennepin County, and I'm also the co-chair of the Minnesota County Recorders Association's Legislative Committee, for which I represent today. While the Minnesota County Recorders Association agrees that clean water is an important cause, an added surcharge to the recording fee is not the appropriate funding source for such an initiative. As has been stated, the current uniform recording fees were established in 2005 and supported by a wide range of coalition of interests, including Minnesota County Recorders, the Land Title Association, the Real Property Section of the Minnesota State Bar Association, and the Minnesota Realtors. This legislation is now a model for similar legislation throughout the country. These predictable fees are designed to ensure that each county recording office charges uniform fees for each document that allow our industry partners to transact business with us and support real estate commerce in our state. The current recording fee is standard across the state and title companies and others who may rely on recording services know that there's one uniform recording fee for all counties and for most document types. This brings simplification and uniformity to the real estate industry, especially those who operate in multiple or even all counties. Predictable recording fees are desired as an industry standard for many reasons, with the ability to comply with consumer protection laws high on the list. Minnesota recorders prefer transparency in the fee that's charged for the recording service. A legitimate concern is that once one surcharge is added to the recording fee, the fee will become a vehicle for other surcharges to fund other programs and or causes that are just as worthy as clean water. We are not just concerned about how adding surcharges to the recording fee affects recorders, but also how those surcharges affect our customers. The proposed legislation amendment continue to be concerning to recorders because although not permissive, it still only applies to certain documents. It would also apply to all transactions that are subject to mortgage registration and or state deed tax, regardless of the amount, thereby impacting residential transactions that are $3,000 and above in the same manner as a large commercial transaction. Also, not all constituents that pay this fee will see a direct benefit as some properties are not located within a soil and water conservation district, district due to being, being in a township. If this provision becomes law, Minnesota will go from having one uniform transparent recording fee to having a different fee for mortgages and deeds. 
Some of the advantages to the current predictable fees are that when submitters can effectively predict recording fees, there is a reduction in errors. For recorders, this results in fewer rejections for shortages and overages, resulting in a cost savings to county employee time, postage, and office supplies. Ms. Bourget, would you please finish up, please? Yep, I've just got a few more, a few more lines. The primary benefits of predictable recording fees for consumers are avoiding delays in closing costs, confusing fee charges for the need to have disclosures to be re-executed, all leading to a more transparent experience for the consumer. I'd like, also like to mention that 1050 of the recording fee goes to the state general fund and could be a solution for this funding. The Minnesota Co Recorders Mr. Association- Jay, please, please finish this up, please. Thank you for your time today. All right, thank you. And sorry for mispronouncing your name. No time. problem, so, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Brian Martinson. Hello, Mr. Chair and Yes, members. welcome to the committee. Please state your name. Yes, my name is Brian Martinson. I'm the Environment and Natural Resources Policy Analyst with the Association of Minnesota Counties. I'd like to thank Representative Hansen for the changes that he's made to his proposal and it addresses several of the concerns that have been raised by counties, and it also focuses the bill's purpose. AMC would like to take a closer look at the proposal to understand what this would mean for communities across the state and their conservation efforts. AMC believes that conservation and SWCD funding should be a state and local partnership. You will find in the AMC letter that I submitted to the committee, counties are investing local levy dollars in conservation and in the SWCDs. Those numbers have continued to grow every year and larger increases over the last six years since state investment have increased those totals by more than 6 million to nearly $20 million I would also be interested in seeing the data that supports the claim that counties have stopped supporting SWCDs. The data I've reviewed uh, does not support that claim. Over the last six years, the state has supplemented the county allocations with clean water funds. That investment has enhanced the work of the districts across the state and allowed them to achieve greater mm -hmm. outcomes without than they would have achieved without the supplemental funding. State investments have lifted everyone up in a way that reliance on only local funding cannot. And I hope that this proposal is not intended to replace the state support with more, more local dollars. A quick review of the Department of Revenue estimates that suggest in 2020, a historically high year for transactions that total revenue from this proposal would reach approximately $11 million statewide. However, the funds will be collected by the county and spent in that county. According to a breakdown of those same 2020 numbers, the data from the DOR, approximately 70% of the mortgage and DV revenues are generated in the 10 largest counties by population. So while this could be a positive result and outcomes for those communities, we will need to take a closer look at the impacts of this approach because it may not translate well to the amount of soil and water conservation needs for all counties. We look for, forward to further discussions about this potential reform to local conservation spending and hope that we can do that hand in hand with a continued discussion of a state investment. Thank you. Mr. Martinson, thank you so much. So before we go to members' questions, uh, Representative Hansen, any comment to um, testifiers and so forth? Anything you'd like to say right now? Yes, I need to counter a couple of statements that were made. So a soil and water conservation district in a county, uh, for example, uh, uh, Chair Marquardt in Clay County, it includes the townships. So uh, the whole county is the con soil and water conservation district. There are two counties where the, the soil and water, there are two soil and water 
conservation districts because of the size of the counties. And then uh, there's one county where it doesn't quite cover the entire county, but covers the vast majority of the county. So uh, the statement that townships are not included in soil and water districts is incorrect. Uh, secondly, uh, existing law uh, in, let me just find the citation here. So this bill is modeled after the existing law conservation fee, which uh, if you give me just a moment, It's Minnesota statute 40A.152, the county conservation fee, uh, where the $5 fee is on the transaction. So we're modeling the very same language uh, here. So the discussion about uh, this hasn't been applied or it's not applied evenly or all of those things, you had an existing fee in the metro area. And what the bill as amended does is provides $25 uh, across the board. I so appreciate Mr. Representative Hansen. I'm going to cut you off right there. Thank you. I, I've been noticed by we have to be done at 730. I, oh. I forgot <laughs> there was a time limit tonight uh, again, but it is 730. So can you save some of that for your final comments? Rep? What do you have left there, Representative Hansen, so we can go to. Yes, I'll be, uh, I'll be short. Sorry. All right. Thank you. So Representative Swazinski. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And th this question would be for, uh, uh, to staff or to anyone that would like to answer it. So it's my understanding that this $25 fee would be on any transaction over $3,000. So it would affect uh, working families the same amount as it would be for a large business. Um, so, I mean, could we consider this a kind of a regressive tax or a regressive fee? Um, so a larger percentage and would that in turn, would that make housing or affordable housing more expensive? Uh, in the state? Uh, Ms. Hagler, the question is, is this fee apply equally across uh, no matter what income level? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Swazinski, yes, um, it would be, the fee would apply to any transaction subject to the um, mortgage or deed tax, regardless of how expensive the property is or how much the mortgage is. Very good. Representative Swazinski. So, Mr. Chair, just you know, we've heard like progressive tax and we've heard regressive tax. So, would this be considered progressive, or would this be considered regressive? Um, you can represent Swazinski. That's, uh, I, I guess, you would have to figure that out. It seems to apply equally to everyone. Representative Swazinski? I'm, I'm through, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And my question is for uh, Mr. Eggert, if he's still available. Uh, who, uh, Mr. Eggert. Um, Mr. Eggert, uh, you represent the Realtors Association, which I am a member of and a licensed broker. Um, in December of uh, last year, uh, median home prices in the Twin Cities uh, reached $310,000 per home. That's uh, half being above that amount and half being below. Uh, Mr. Eggert, could you share what the rates of uh, taxation for state deed tax and mortgage registration tax are for members of the committee? Uh, uh, well, Mr. Mr. Eggert, answer that quickly if you can. We've got a couple more minutes, then we're going to move to a closing uh, comments and a vote. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, real quickly, Representative Hurtas, the deed tax is 0.33% on the consideration, and the mortgage registry tax is 0.23% on the mortgage amount. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so, members, um, you know, typically a, a home is financed, a new purchase would be 80% loan to value, would be the maximum amount. And just using the median home price, we're talking about $1,023 of state deed tax is collected on an average or median sale price in the Twin Cities, plus another $570 for mortgage registration tax. That totals $1,600 for today's current median home price. Now this money is all deposited into the general fund. And I don't know what the number is, maybe uh, staff would know, but 
currently uh, we're, we're in excess of $250 million of collections into the general fund. So the more appropriate way to do this is to appropriate the money from the general fund rather than adding on lopsided fees to what is already a heavily burdened industry with, with regard to making home affordability and home prices even more expensive. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hurtas. Um, Representative Hansen, one minute on a closing or less, if you could, please. I see no one's clear. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. And I think it's important to remember why this bill is here. Uh, we have a limited constitutional fund that has specific purposes. Distributing $100,000 a year to each county for a soil and water district, each soil and water district, uh, regardless of size, regardless of population, regardless, regardless of land, is the current status quo. That is not base funding. The legacy dollars are not base funding. They are two-year appropriations, and they will end in 12 years. This is a solution to a problem that people prefer to ignore. Six years have gone by, number of task forces, number of meetings, number of Representative Hanson, we need to move to the vote. I'd ask for your support. This solves a problem that is real. Very good. I'd like to re thank you very much, Representative Hanson. I'd like to uh, renew my motion to re-refer House File 1733 as amended to the Committee on Environment, Natural Resources, Finance, and Policy. Ms. Griska, please take the roll. Marquardt. Aye. Marquardt, aye. aye. Ms. Lagarde. Aye. Nice. Lagarde, aye. David. David Snow. David Snow. Bajay. Aye. Bajay, aye. Carlson. Carlson, aye. Carlson, aye. Detmer. Nay. Nee. That were no. Garofalo. Garofalo. Gomez. Gomez, I. Gomez, I. Her. Her, I. Her, I. Hurtas. Hurtas, no. Hurtas, no. Howard. I. Howard, I. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Miller. Miller, no. Miller, no. Moran. Moran. Mortensen. Mortensen, no. Mortensen, no. Robbins. No. Robbins, no. Sundell. Aye. Sundell, aye. Schultz. Aye. Schultz, aye. Stevenson. Aye. Stevenson, aye. Swazinski. No. Swazinski, no. Joachim. Aye. Joachim, aye. Garofalo. Moran. There being, uh, would you care to announce that, Ms. Griska? Yep, there's 11 ayes, eight nays. There being 11 ayes and eight nays, the uh, motion does prevail. Uh, House file 1733, as amended, is re-referred to the Committee on Environment, Natural Resources, Finance, and Policy. Members, thank you for your work today. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>